Brothers and sisters, good morning. Welcome once again to the EM at Solomon Presbyterian Church. May the Lord bless us this morning as we receive his word. Let's pray once again before we start today's message. Father God, we thank you that you have called us here together. For we are broken and shattered. We are insecure. We have so many worries in our life. So many things that keep us up at night. But yet we have this blessing that every Sunday morning we can come before your presence and to, together as a body of Christ worship you. We worship you through song. We worship you through prayer. And we worship you through your word. So may you lead us and guide us this morning. May you open our hearts to receive what the Holy Spirit has in store for us. That your word may be our strength. Your word may be our wisdom. Your word may be our hope. So we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The book of Jonah, we've looked chapter by chapter from chapters 1 through 3. It is the story of the Lord's mercy, the Lord's compassion, the Lord's salvation, those who are willing to turn away from the world and turn their faces towards him. It is a story of how the Lord's salvation isn't just for a certain group of people, but for all people who are willing to worship him, trust in him, and be faithful in him. We have seen how the salvation of the Lord came to the sailors on the ship, to Jonah himself, for the Lord provided a big fish to save him when he was in the deep, dark seas. And we saw also that the Lord had compassion on the Ninevites when they turned from their evil ways and turned to the Lord. Last time, we discussed that as a result of the Lord's compassion and mercy, we are people of the second chance. In our weakness, when we turn away from the Lord, God actually does not give up on us, but rather continues to give us chance after chance to turn our lives back to him. It is because of the Lord's mercy that we should not be ashamed or feel guilty of our past because he is a God of second chances and we are the people of the second chance. When we are willing to turn back to the Lord, he is merciful and will forgive us of our sins. So the book of Jonah, chapters 1 through 3, seem to give us the entire picture. The Lord's mercy, turning in repentance towards the Lord and receiving the Lord's salvation. The sailors on the ship returned home walking with the Lord. Jonah went on to proclaim the message that the Lord wanted him to proclaim in Nineveh. And the Ninevites, believing the word of the Lord, received the Lord's salvation as well. So that's it, isn't it? That should be the end of the story. This is a happy ending for everyone. Everyone is safe. Everyone is saved. All is well. But there remains one more chapter, Jonah chapter 4. Although all seems well, all is not well. So let's look together today at Jonah chapter 4 and see the human condition. The message that Jonah proclaimed to the Ninevites was 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. 40 more days and Nineveh will be destroyed. It will be the end of the enemies of the Israelites. But the people and the king of Nineveh believed God's message, believed that the message was from God, believed that God would indeed bring destruction upon their land. And even though not knowing if it was possible to th turn things around, they repented. They turned from their evil ways and turned to the Lord. Upon the Lord's compassion for Nineveh, it made it seem like Jonah was incompetent, that he didn't know what he was talking about, because what he proclaimed didn't come to pass. So in today, Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, it says, But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. Although Jonah verses chapter 1 through 3, we see the Lord's salvation over and over again, from the sailors to Jonah to the Ninevites 
all is well. The story could end at Jonah chapter 3. But we have chapter 4 where it says Jonah seemed like all that had happened was wrong. And he became angry. Jonah thought to himself, how could the Lord turn back on his word and forgive these people? These evil Ninevites. How could he save people that were not his people? An enemy of the Israelites. Very wrong in the original Hebrew is actually better translated as evil. To Jonah, this seemed evil, and he became angry. It seemed to Jonah that it was evil that the Lord forgave the Ninevites and gave them a second chance. Because of the Lord's salvation, Jonah became angry, enraged, and believed that this compassion on Nineveh was wrong and an act of evil. This is how much Jonah disagreed and couldn't stand what had happened. Although this anger Jonah was an act of evil in Jonah's eyes, Jonah claimed that the reason why he initially didn't go to Nineveh was because he knew that the Lord was capable of this type of compassion. Let's continue to look. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. For Jonah is hurt to see the Lord's compassion and love being shared with his enemy. Jonah is hurt by this. And even though Jonah knew that the Lord is gracious and compassionate, he fled to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, trying to forestall even the possibility of the Lord's salvation to come upon Nineveh. That's how much he disdained the Ninevites. Let's continue to look at verse 3 and 4. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? How angry Jonah must have been that something like this could happen, that even he wanted to face death, thinking that death was better than life. He wanted to end his life because the Lord had compassion on the Ninevites. This almost seems like an immature child complaining or pouting, as if Jonah is like a child saying, I knew it. See, that is why I didn't want to go to Nineveh. This isn't fair. I knew it. I knew it. Oh, just end my life now. My life is over. Does it feel in a way that Jonah is blowing things out of proportion? Brothers and sisters, do we sometimes also blow things out of proportion? Perhaps actual events aren't that serious. And perhaps it isn't a matter of life and death. But when our feelings are involved, sometimes we too respond with greater emotion than perhaps is appropriate for certain circumstances. Sometimes we also feel like things aren't fair when people are shown mercy around us, when people don't get what we think they deserve, do we also become angry? Do we pout and even even give up on certain things because we don't want to face a world that we consider unfair and unjust? And how does the Lord respond in verse 4? The Lord says, Is it right for you to be angry? Brothers and sisters, was it right for Jonah to be angry? For Jonah, it sure felt like he had the right. Perhaps we too feel like we have the right as well, because we feel like we know what it means to be fair and unfair. I know I'm throwing a lot of questions at us to consider, but as we think about these things, let's continue to move on. Next, we're going to see a story within a story, within the story of Jonah and the Ninevites we see a smaller story about Jonah trying to provide for himself versus what the Lord could provide for him. So let's continue to look at verses 5 and 6. Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city, to Nineveh. Verse 6, Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. So Jonah made himself a shelter. 
However, we see that this shelter has flaws in it because the Lord needed to provide a leafy plant and make it grow in order to give shade for Jonah's head to ease his discomfort. Although Jonah made himself a shelter, he still was not comfortable and was not happy until the plant the Lord provided grew over him. Let's continue to look at verses 7 and 8. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, once again, it would be better for me to die than to live. So as quickly as the Lord God provided comfort to Jonah, something that Jonah could not do on his own, at the dawn of the next day, God also provided a worm to take away what was initially given to Jonah. Not only did God take away what was given, he also provided a scorching east wind that made Jonah perhaps even more uncomfortable than he initially was before he made for himself a shelter. Again, Jonah wanted to die. This time not because of the compassion that the Lord showed to Nineveh, but because of what the Lord took away from Jonah. Let's continue on, verses 9 through 11. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend to it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. So what is Jonah's main issue? He seems to be very self-centered, very focused on himself, as if he were the main character of the story. Actually, many times when we read the book of Jonah, we think that Jonah is the main character of the story. But as I mentioned last time, the main character of the story isn't Jonah, but God. Throughout the entire book of Jonah, we see over and over again, the Lord provided. The Lord provided. It's the same in Jonah chapter 4 as well. We see that the Lord provided the big fish for Jonah to be saved. We see that the Lord provided in today's scripture this plant. He also provided this worm. He provided this experience for Jonah to learn and uh, to grow. Jonah is not in control, and his life isn't the main focus of the story, even though initially it looks like it is. But the main focus is on the Lord and the Lord's salvation. The Lord said to Jonah that he has been concerned about the plant for providing shelter, but this was also provided by the Lord. Not, not something that Jonah did or made. Not because Jonah deserved or didn't deserve this. This is what the Lord provided in his mercy to Jonah. Jonah is so concerned about that which is not his, how should the Lord not be concerned with the people of Nineveh? The main focus of the book of Jonah is the saving grace of our Lord. But Jonah wants the story to be about himself. Brothers and sisters, I asked earlier if Jonah's circumstances were fair or unfair. Did Jonah have a right to be angry? Do we have a right to be angry about our life, about what happens to the world around us, to what we perceive to be fair or unfair? Of course, we can be angry. We can complain. We can also be like Jonah and run off to Tarshish as well. But in the end, this is the Lord's story, not Jonah's story, not our story. But that is where the issue is. If everything is about the Lord and the Lord's salvation, Jonah chapter 3 would be the end of this book. But we need Jonah chapter 4 because we are humans living in this world. As humans living in this world, we face questions about human existence, about our purpose on earth, about our relationship with others, with ourselves. 
and with God. Although through Jesus Christ, we have also experienced the Lord's salvation, but we continue to live in this world. We continue to face ups and downs. We continue to face issues of injustice, conflict. We have our hopes and dreams. We have our goals. And in our later years of life, we face our own mortality. Brothers and sisters, this is the human condition as it clashes with the work, plan, and the will of God. The human condition is all of the characteristics and key events that compose the essentials of human existence, including our birth, growth, emotion, our aspirations, our goals and hopes for life, conflict, and our mortality. If we are purely to look only at the work of the Lord in a vacuum, we will see that the Lord's mercy and compassion on all these people in the book of Jonah. We can declare that the Lord is great, that the Lord is just, that the Lord is full of love and mercy, that the Lord is our Savior. However, since we are like Jonah, a human facing life, a human with emotions, our own personal goals and hopes and dreams, conflicts with people, facing life and death, sickness and illness, all of a sudden the main focus many times isn't on what is important to God, but what is important to us. From Jonah's perspective, he was so focused on the Ninevites, his enemies, that from his perspective, their salvation was evil in his eyes. But from the Lord's perspective, this is a beautiful picture of the Lord's love for his creation, including the Ninevites. Brothers and sisters, do we see the world, the kingdom of God, our faith, our church, from our own perspective or from the Lord's perspective? Do we decide if something is fair or unfair based on our own definition of justice and righteousness? Even though all that the Lord does is fair because it is done by the Lord, because he is God, because he is the creator. He is the one that is providing the salvation. Isn't this the issue that the eldest son faced in the story of the prodigal son? Let me quickly read the story from Luke 15 about a man and his two sons. I'll leave this image on the PowerPoint, and I'll just read the story for everyone. Let's all listen to God's word. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the state. So the father divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered and wasted his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Oh, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When the younger son, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. He was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. 
he was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants over and asked them what was going on. The servant said, your brother has come. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But the older son answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has wasted your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Brothers and sisters, it is difficult for us to see the world from the perspective of God because we are humans living in human bodies, facing a broken and sinful world, facing our own emotions, our fears, all the things that make us human. The human condition makes it hard for us to agree many times with the things of God, especially when they are in opposition with our own personal joy and fulfillment. Because of the human condition, we compare ourselves with others. We make judgments on what is fair or unfair. Just as the father's love for the younger son, it didn't mean he loved the eldest son any less. The Lord's mercy and compassion on Nineveh doesn't mean he loved Israel or Jonah any less. The book of Jonah, and I would actually submit the whole Bible, gives us a perspective outside of the human condition so that we can be challenged to break out of this me, me, me cycle and break ourselves out of thinking that our existence, our lives, our joy and satisfaction should be linked to this world, but rather should be linked to the kingdom of God. Even though Jonah couldn't understand or accept what happened in Nineveh, but after knowing it was the will of God, an act of the Lord's mercy and compassion on his creation, Jonah could at least acknowledge that although he isn't pleased, but the Lord's will be done. Brothers and sisters, our faith isn't a faith about God satisfying us because we are the main characters of the story, but rather about the Lord's will being done over his creation. This is what we pray in our Lord's prayer, isn't it? Your kingdom come, your will be done. We don't pray my kingdom come, my will be done, but we pray that the Lord's will be done in our lives. If Jonah was focused on the Lord's kingdom and will, perhaps even though his emotions may not have changed, he could still be angry. But he could have not acknowledged that even though he wasn't happy, but at least the will of the Lord was done. The eldest son, knowing the love of the father, even though he wasn't happy with the situation, could at least know, if he truly loved his father, that as long as his father was happy that his younger brother came home, that he should at least be happy for his father, that he can join them in the party, even though emotionally he wasn't happy. We too should also learn in our emotions, in our struggles, to find comfort knowing that and believing that no matter what happens in our life and in this world, that the Lord's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let God be God. He is the author the composer, the authority. The Lord is full of mercy, compassionate, and full of grace. Compassion even to those that we think do not deserve compassion. Having mercy on those that we dislike, that we might even consider to be our enemies. He is gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from slending calamity. That is why we have an opportunity for salvation through Jesus Christ. 
At one point in time, we were also not deserving because we are not the Israelites. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is our hope. This is hope for the world. This is the Lord's story, the story of the Lord's salvation. Let us pray together. Father God, we thank you. Through these past four sermons, chapter by chapter, we can look at the book of Jonah. Initially, we think Jonah is the main character of the story, and we follow Jonah's path closely. But in the end, we see that the story is the Lord's story, a story of the Lord's salvation and grace for this world. If this story was just about Jonah, it would end with a disappointment. It would end with anger. And from Jonah's perspective, it would end with evil. But the story is not about our story, but it is about the Lord's story, the Lord's compassion and love for this world. So Father God, may you help us to see, despite our emotions, our judgments of unfair and fair, our judgments of things that happen in this world, that we can believe and understand that you are in control and that whatever happens has a purpose and whatever happens is your will being done on earth, no matter if we understand or not. And even though we have different emotions, we can be angry about what happens in this world, but may we believe in the end that it is your will being done on earth as it is in heaven. So we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.